that we are children of God. Thank you that you set us free. Thank you for all that you've done for us and that we get to sing in this freedom. I thank you for everything that you've done for us. I thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, welcome to Antioch International Church. You may be seated. Um, first, we are going to dismiss the children and youth to their classes. I guess I'll go join. No, I'm joking. Um, this Friday at 7 p.m., we are having our worship and prophetic night. It's here in the barn, and we highly encourage you coming out. It's going to be a lot of fun. The Holy Spirit's going to show up, as he always does, and it's going to be a lot of fun. You're, not, you're going to want to come. Um, this Saturday at 9 a.m. in the chapel, there is a men's breakfast being held, so all you men are invited to that. And now we will be taking our tithes and offerings. My parents reminded me that it's actually a blessing to give our tithes and offerings because when we give it to God, then he exponentially blesses us back. So let's take our tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we have the privilege of giving back to you what you've given to us. I thank you for the blessings that you've given us. I pray that, um, yeah, I thank you for all of that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, all the ways are listed on the screen behind me. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, this will be streamed on Facebook and YouTube, and we encourage you to share that. And now for Pastor Peter, we'll be welcoming up now. Thank you, Ethan. I think that was the first time he ever did announcements for us. So give him a hand. <laughs> Pastors Jesse and Liz and Renee and other leaders here are away with um, matters of state. They're at political rallies. You know, Elizabeth is running for public office. And so she is extremely busy. I think it's just about every night she's at a different meeting, meeting with other people, and fighting the good fight of faith for the nation. She's an outstanding candidate, and I'm so proud of her. Um, and so we said, Ethan, why don't you do the announcements? And uh, he reluctantly said, yes, I will. He's a fine young man. There's things we have to do sometimes reluctantly, but we should still do them because they're part of our training. Well, we're into a study on the mountaintop prophecies of Israel. And this is our last study. It's study number four. And I'm going to very quickly give a review of what has taken place so far. These verses that we're studying come from Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. You should be receiving notes for study number four, but I'm going to give a review, so please don't get into those studies, study notes until we're ready for them. But I mention at the top of each of these studies that the four mountaintop prophecies which we're studying must be declared first before Israel's end time promises can be completed. Now let me remind you what the eight end time prophecies are for Israel. The Bible says these things will happen. And there's eight of them. Eight is the number for resurrection. You know, six is the number of man and seven is the number for perfection. And eight is the number for new beginnings or resurrection. And it's the number for Israel. Israel's number is eight because this is the nation that after 2,000 years has come back to life again in 1948. And it has to do with the end time promises of God for Israel. So I'm going to just give you these eight end time promises for Israel. And all of these things will be fulfilled. Some of them are already partly fulfilled. So number one, God gives Israel their land. 
The land will grow from what it is now. Number two, God will gather his people from around the world. And uh, about eight plus million people have come to Israel since the Second World War uh, from nations round about the world. The third thing is that God will restore their fortunes before their very eyes, which of course he has been doing in our lifetime. The fourth promise for Israel in the end of the age is that God will raise up prayer. He says, I set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, who will not rest or give me any rest until I make Jerusalem the praise of the whole earth. So these watchmen on the walls are intercessors and all around the world, people, intercessors are praying for Israel. Uh, this never happened a hundred years ago in any grand or, or extensive way, but it is today. And number five, the fifth promise for Israel is that God promises to give them military protection. It actually will one day be supernatural military protection. And it is amazing if you study since 1948 the history of Israel and how this tiny little nation uh, has been protected. Uh, they fought against five armies to start with, surrounding armies, and they actually had one airplane and one tank. And they didn't really have many guns or anything because they weren't allowed to have an army under British rule, but God protected them. And that has gone on and on and on. And you will see that Israel will not lose another battle uh, until the Lord returns at that time. There will be the battle of Armageddon. Well, then we read in number five, number six, sorry, that God will bring revival to Israel. And you can look at the scriptures. If you don't have studies one, two, and three, you may get them from dawn or after the meeting. You can come up here and you can look at the verses and find that Israel will have an amazing end time revival. And then number seven, God will share his glory with Israel. And some people think that God won't share his glory with anyone. But that's a misinterpretation of scripture. The scripture that says, I will not share my glory with another, says, I will not. The next line says, I will not share it with demons. So he's saying he won't share his glory with another God. But actually, he has called you to share glory with him. He says, arise and shine, for your light has come, for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So this is the plan of God, is to bring, to justify you, to sanctify you, and to glorify you, and to pour his glory upon you. And that's an end time promise for Israel. And then God promises number eight, that he will judge the nations who have opposed Israel. He says, I will gather you together, nations, in Joel chapter 3, from all around the world, and there I shall judge you for how you've treated my inheritance, the people of Israel, and you divided up my land and sold my sons and daughters for wine and prostitution. And he says, therefore, I will judge you. And that is actually the battle of Armageddon. Armageddon. So there are eight end time promises. If you go and listen to study number one, you'll get them in detail. And then we looked at study number two about the blessing of God, the first prophetic word um, out of these four covering prophecies, and it is over the land. You see, the book of Ezekiel is an amazing book. It talks about angels and seraphim. It talks about the, the throne room of God and the river of God. And then it, uh, Ezekiel talks about 30 different prophecies where it, the Bible says, Son of man, prophesy. And 26 of those prophecies are judgmental prophecies. Uh, prophesy against Lebanon, prophesy against Sidon, prophesy against the sins of Jerusalem, and so on. There's only four out of the 30 that are positive. And all of them are found in these two chapters, in chapter 36 and 37. And they are prophecies for Israel. And Ezekiel is told to prophesy. And the first one we see in Ezekiel 
chapter 36, verse 1. Son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. And we read on, uh, it says in verse 4, Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the, the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the mountains, the hills, the ravines, and the valleys, to the desolate ruins and deserted towns that have been plundered and ridiculed. And he goes on to say that you will be blessed and you're going to have abundance. And so we're going to Israel on the 6th of September. And when I planned this trip, I called our company in, our tour company in Israel and said we want to do this as quickly as possible with our calendar it came out to September the 6th and that day the Lord said you're going to prophesy over the mountains of Israel four times and I didn't know what I was going to prophesy about but that week I, I met with somebody I hadn't met with before and it was a prophet and he spoke to me we had lunch together but then he said Oh, by the way, I have a word that from the four winds, you're going to prophesy and life is going to be released. And he said, this is found in the book of Ezekiel. When I got home, I opened the book of Ezekiel. Uh, I just put, it, put the Bible on my lap and I opened it just like this. And it was at the very verse that he had mentioned. And there I read it. And then I said, well, Lord, there must be these four prophecies in Ezekiel. And I started to go through the search. That's when I found 30 prophecies, but 26 of them I knew were not the right ones. <laughs> but four of them were. And this first one is a prophecy over the land. It's a prophecy that God is going to bless the land with great abundance. When you come with us to Israel, you will see this. You'll see just the, the whole desert blossoming like a rose, so fertile. It's amazing, the agricultural uh, endeavors of the people of Israel. They are the ones who invented drip irrigation, these brown pipes that you see going through uh, horticultural settings, and they just drip, drip, drip uh, at, at the root of a tree or uh, a bush, and they stay alive even in hot, hot weather. And so... The Jews have done this from the Jordan River. Mostly they've taken the water and they have irrigated. So when you're driving down the Jordan Valley uh, for a couple of hours from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, you're going to see the whole area for like half a mile wide, just lush green with all kinds of date palms and fruit trees and, and vegetables growing all over the place. So this is an amazing miracle. And this is just the beginning. Do you know the Bible says that when Jesus puts his throne in Jerusalem, water is going to gush up. And then there, and it will cause a river that go, will go down to the Dead Sea and cause it to come to life and have all kinds of fish in it. And it says on either side of the river, there will be trees for the healing of the nation. And the trees will bear 12 different kinds of fruit, one for each month. Well, I actually don't even believe it needs to be a miracle. Uh, because already the, the Jewish people have a tree that grows four different kinds of fruit on it. And uh, perhaps this one will be a miracle tree. Uh, but uh, the agricultural uh, endeavors are blossoming, and the Lord prophesies. This will be the first prophecy that we speak on this trip. Now, we're going to have four prayer meetings where we will end up prophesying over the land. And I'm so happy um, that Kathleen brought to my attention that no longer when you arrive at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, Israel, do you have to have another COVID test? Which means, you know, it, it was that you had to land, get a COVID test, get on the bus, and go immediately to your hotel. You're not allowed to leave the hotel until um, they contact you and tell you 
that you have negative COVID test and you can go on with your tour. And they say it takes about 12 hours. Well, that process has now been eliminated by the Israeli government. So we'll still need to get a test here before we get on a flight. But when we get there, there is no test. You just get on the bus, which means we can do a number of things. One, we can visit some sites on the way to the hotel. So we will go to Jaffa, or Joppa, as it says in the Bible, where Peter was in the house of Simon the Tanner on a street called Straight when he got the vision and then the friends of the servants of Cornelius were knocking at the door and he went 40 miles from there to the coast where he met with in Caesarea and met Cornelius and the Holy Spirit came upon the Italians and it was an amazing event because it wasn't just Jews who were receiving Christ but now the Gentiles were receiving Christ and from there it went to the four corners of the earth but this first prophecy uh, we're going to proclaim it that night once we get to Netanya about an hour north of the airport uh, we'll have an evening meal and then we'll go down its every room looks out its window onto the Mediterranean Sea and we'll go out of our rooms and go down to the huge beach on the shores of the Mediterranean and those who aren't too tired from jet lag uh, can join me and we'll go down there in the evening under a starlit sky and we'll start to praise the Lord and have a prayer meeting together and then we're going to prophesy the first uh, prophecy and uh, when I, we say that mountaintop prophecies of Israel we're not necessarily talking about mountains but high points of purpose and so this is the gateway to Israel the beach it's the the, the place of the harbor that opens up from the Mediterranean into the land and so we will bless the land and prophesy over it in the name of the Lord and that will be our first prophetic word. And then the second prophetic word uh, is found in Ezekiel 37 and verse 1. And it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones, and he led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And so I prophesied to the bones. And then I heard a rattling and a sound and a coming together of bones and flesh came upon them and skin came upon them. And there was a huge army, but they had no life in them. And this is the second prophecy prophesied to the bones so the bones have come from all over the nations they've come from Russia and Poland and Czechoslovakia which is Czech Republic and Slovakia now and from China and from Argentina and from the United States of America from all over the world the Jewish people have come for the great Aliyah They've come together and the bones have come together and the infrastructure has come together. The relationships, the joints, the ligaments, the tendons, the flesh and Israel has become a nation uh, and this is going to grow and grow and grow. In fact, the Lord says, I will make your people like flocks that gather at the time of the feasts of the Lord. And there's 60,000 sheep that would be killed, for example, at the feast of Passover or the feast of tabernacles. Because every family would have to get a lamb and have it sacrificed. And of course they would get a portion of the lamb to take home and eat. Uh, but the, some of it would be burned and some of it would go to priests because there's 4,500 priests that are there too, uh, Levites. And so the, the Lord says, like the flocks that will be sacrificed 
during the time of the feasts, I will bring my people to the land and they shall be a flock of people that shall cover the land and be on the mountains that are blossoming and full of the abundance of fruit. And the second prophecy that we will give probably will be on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And there we will prophesy and say, dry bones, come together. We speak to you in the name of the Lord. And we'll call to the north and the south and the east and the west. And we'll call the people that have not yet come, the Jewish people. And I should let you know that the Bible in two places does say that there will be Gentiles who will come and live in the land with Israel at the end of the age. So maybe you will be one of those people if you're not Jewish. But more and more people are taking DNA tests and discovering that they are 20% Jewish or, you know, the whole world is tossed salad now. It's all mixed together, especially if you're from Europe. You probably have some Jewish blood or from northern Africa. Uh, though your skin might be black, you likely have some Jewish blood in you, like Condoleezza Rice. Uh, I remember when she was getting her um, history kind of told to her through, uh, I think it's Henry Gates, uh, and uh, he f said, flip the page, and she flipped the page, and, and he says, you might not have known, but you're 25% Jewish. And Condoleezza Rice <laughs> said, what? You know, what a surprise. Yeah, because so many Jews um, moved into North Africa. You have to think of Egypt, that 70 Jews led by Jacob went into Egypt during the time of famine. They stayed there for almost 450 years. And by the time they left in the Exodus, there was 2 million Jews. So you can be sure there was a lot of intermarrying with the Egyptians. And you know, Ethiopia, Northern Africa, it is mentioned 50 times in the Bible. An Ethiopian eunuch, the queen of Sheba, is the queen of Ethiopia. Bathsheba, Bathsheba, the one who David married. Uh, Bathsheba means daughter of Ethiopia. So these, it was an Ethiopian who pulled Jeremiah out of the pit. You can find it 50 times in the Bible. And Poland and New York aren't mentioned once. So the whole of North Africa has Jewish blood mingled in it. And many African-American people do not know that when they came here under terrible conditions during the time of slavery, that many of them had roots that were intermingled with Israel. And I uh, like my good friend Dumasani Washington, who says the hope for the black church in America is that they find their connection with Israel and their end time purpose. So this is an amazing story and we will prophesy the second prophecy down at the Sea of Galilee and it is a prophecy about the gathering of the people, the bones coming together. Now there's two more prophecies that the Lord has instructed me specifically to prophesy when we are in Israel. One will probably be in the outskirts of Jerusalem, probably on the roof of the Millennium Center uh, with Barry and Batia Siegel and Vision for Israel. And uh, it will be the third or the fourth and final prophecy. But the third one will probably be down at the Dead Sea. And um, let's look at this third prophecy now. We go to Ezekiel chapter 37. And verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, 
there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And so now comes the next prophecy. Verse 9, Ezekiel 37, verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. So this is spiritual life. Because when these bones come together and they have the flesh on them, that's what we have in Israel today. There is a movement, a messianic movement, where Jews are slowly coming to the Lord. Um, and so there are more and more congregations and house groups, small groups, and secret Jewish believers uh, that are not letting other people know that they found that Jesus is Messiah. I remember the story told to me by Lance um, years ago, and he was a great prophet in um, Israel, and he said that one day, while he was living in Israel, this is not Lance Walno, by the way, um, and uh, he was a good friend of my grandfather, Derek Prince. And while he was there, he said he got this phone call. And uh, it was the secretary of a rabbi. And she said, hello, uh, sir, the rabbi would like to come and see you tonight. He'll be there at 8 o'clock. Please open the door and let him in and close the door quickly. Uh, because Lance was a great minister of the gospel. He was a Jewish man, but a Christian through and through. So here, this 8 o'clock, the doorbell rang, and Lance opened the door, and there was this rabbi with his ringlets, his big beard, his hat, his black coat, his pantaloon, the whole nine yards. And Lance opened the door and let him in, and then they had a long talk, and this rabbi said, uh, I have come to believe from the study of the scriptures and my own personal research that Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus is our Messiah. And I want to learn more about this. I want to ask you these questions. So they spent a couple of hours together talking theology, uh, going through the Old Testament scriptures that point to the Messiah and how he fulfilled them in the New Testament scriptures. And at the end, they sat and were very quiet together. And then Lance spoke up and said, so what will you do? You're not a Christian. You're not uh, practicing as a Jew. Now, completely at least. And it seems like you don't fit anywhere. And he said, oh, don't worry about me. There are 20 other rabbis who also believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And this was years ago when he told me this story. So there is life coming. But it's not coming in explosive ways. It's coming in ones and twos, and, and the number of messianic Jews. Now, you have to ask yourself the question. If a Jew wants to be saved, does he have to change religions and become a Christian? Well, the answer is, of course not. None of the early apostles stopped being Jewish. They just believed that Jesus was Messiah. And then they learned about the new and living way through the new covenant, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
So when a Jew becomes a believer in Jesus the Christ or Yeshua the Messiah, they add something to their Jewish faith. And they realize that no longer will the law save them, no longer will good works save them, but now it is their faith in the Lord Messiah, in Yeshua, in Jesus. And that faith in him is what takes them. And I've had many a discussion with Jewish rabbis, some of them on the plane on the way to Israel. And they would ask me, they'd see that I was Jewish, and they'd say, why don't you come and pray with us? And I said, no, uh, not today. And they said, well, why not? And they tried to convince me. And then, uh, why don't you put on the, uh, the phylactery and come and stand and make a minion and, uh, in the corner of the plane and let's have a synagogue. And I, I would say, no, I don't wear that. He said, why don't you wear that? And I said, because it's just a picture of something that's more real, which is God on your mind and in your hands and on your strength, you're on your arms. And then we got into a big debate and all the people in the plane could hear it because we're both quite vocal. And uh, I, would, I told them, I said, you know, my good friend, you have not kept up with God because he said a new commandment I give unto you and you haven't received the new commandment. He said in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, he says, a new covenant I give you. Not like the old covenant that your fathers had, but one where I will put my spirit in your heart. So I said, you, have you come to this new covenant? He said, I never saw this before. And then I said, there's a lot of other things that are going to be changing for you too. And you have to keep up with God. And after we had talked for about 40 minutes, and everybody in the plane had their necks turned around listening to us go back and forth. Uh, then he said, you know, I think you know more of the Bible than me. I said, I probably do. And I said, and this is the roadway, the doorway for you to come into a whole new level. Because you see, the Old Testament is full of types and pictures and all of the things that you wear and all of the way that you eat and everything that you do, your 613 laws are all pointing to something more real, more spiritual, more dynamic that will make you come alive. And fellowship with God and see his miracles and become messianic. Well, I don't think I convinced him. He certainly didn't convince me. However, there were people on the plane who were really enjoying the tennis game back and forth with uh, our discussions. But the day is coming when suddenly, suddenly, there will be such a revival in Israel. And we are called to prophesy from the four winds. Let the breath of God come into these people. Let the Holy Spirit come. Let revival move. Let there be an explosion of miracles, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, and the power of God moving upon the Holy Land. So God says he doesn't do anything without first sharing it with his servants, the prophets. The book of Amos says, the lion has roared, who can but prophesy? So this will be our task with the third prophecy down at the Dead Sea, because one day that will come to life, just like the dry bones will come to life, the Dead Sea, which doesn't have anything living in it, 
is going to teem with all kinds of fish once the rivers come from under the throne room of God. And we're going to read about this here in Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. First of all, we go to chapter 36 and we find out what the Lord says about the sins of Israel in verse, six, in verse 16, verse 36 and 16. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. When the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. So murder and witchcraft. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, yet they had to leave this land. This is the indictment against the Jewish people. And it was off and on since the days of Babylon. And then the Greeks and the Persians and the Romans. And finally they were scattered all around the world under immense judgment and the story continues when we read in verse 31 of Ezekiel 30, 36 and verse um, 31. It says, Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, O house of Israel. But then in verse 33, he says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle you in towns. So the Lord says, I'm going to cleanse you. And that's what this prophecy is all about in chapter 37. And verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. This is the third prophecy. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. So this is a picture of revival. We read in chapter 37 and verse 12. Excuse me. Uh, in verse 37, verse 9 to 10, which we just did. And then we're going to go to 37, verse 23. In verse 23, it says, I will make them one nation in the land. On the mountains of Israel, there will be one king over all of them. And they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses. For I will save them from all their sinful backsliding. And I will cleanse them. They will be my people. And I will be their God. So this is the revival that's still ahead of Israel. Israel has had some revivals. See, the first revival in Israel really took place on the day of Pentecost. All those people, those 3,000 that got saved, they were all Jews. And within the next few years, 5,000, and then 10,000. And they say within 
10 years, one third of the people in the city of Jerusalem had become born again believers in Yeshua. They didn't know that their name was now changed to be Christian. They were just Jews who believed Jesus is Messiah. And the believers at first were called the people of the way. They were called the people of the way because they had found a new and living way through the blood of Jesus into the presence of God, through the curtain and into the holy of holies. That's why they were called the people of the way. And that's what you read in the Bible. But where were they first called Christians? At Antioch. It says the believers were first called Christians or little Christs at Antioch. Right here in this church, actually. A long time ago in another town. <laughs> yeah. And from there, the missions went to the four corners of the known world at that time. So the third prophecy is about revival. And down by the deadest, lowest place on earth, at the Sea of Salt, the Dead Sea, during the night, we will have a prayer meeting. And we will proclaim that these dead waters shall come to life again. And this dead country, spiritually dead, shall come to life with a move of the Holy Spirit. And we will call for the wind from the north and the south and the east and the west. And we will say, come and breathe the breath of God into the Jewish people. Hallelujah. That's actually the main prophecy that I have been asked to prophesy in the land. And then we come to the fourth and final prophecy. And we read about it in Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 12. Therefore prophesy... And say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. O oh my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. So this is a prophecy that goes off into the future. It ties with the second coming of the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. The thing is, it doesn't say anywhere that he turns around and goes back to heaven. It says on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and he will strike down the nations and all the armies of heaven will be with him. And all those who are raised from the grave will be with him. Do you know where he rose, ascended up on high after his resurrection? Do you know where he was? He was on the Mount of Olives. A part of the Mount of Olives which we'll take you to called Mount Scopus. In fact, there's a high steeple peaked church there called the Church of the Ascension because that's the place where 500 were gathered around and then he ascended up and the angel stood and said why stand you gazing this same Jesus that you have seen go up into heaven shall likewise come again in like manner and actually 
it will take place in the same spot. For on that day, it says in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 3, in that day, his feet will land on the Mount of Olives. And just as you have seen him go, he shall come and return. And it's very interesting that the Jewish people have the largest cemetery in the world. And do you know where it is? It's on the Mount of Olives. In fact, when you go there and you're in the old city of Jerusalem and you look across the Kidron Valley, there you will see this section coming kind of like the hood of a car sticking out and it's all white and if you look closely you'll see that it's full of graves why do you think the Jewish people had their graves put on the Mount of Olives because the Bible says in the Old Testament Zechariah that the Lord himself shall come in the midst of battle and he shall land on the Mount of Olives and that's where the resurrection of the dead takes place first and foremost and the Jews want a front row seat so they make sure they're buried on the Mount of Olives as many as they can cram in there see what is resurrection the Bible teaches us what death is. In the book of James, it says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So I don't want you to think about the faith, the faith and the works, but the first part of the verse, the body without the spirit is dead. So when the spirit comes back together and the dead in Christ speaks of the body, it says, and the graves gave up their dead and the sea gave up their dead. And the spirit, of course, the body is remade. Whether it was a child that was killed in the womb through an abortion. I'm pretty sure that when that individual's body comes back, it'll be like a 26-year-old Olympiad. And a grandmother of 96 years of age who only has a few teeth left and can't see and is bent over and her bones are brittle and easily broken. And she's very frail and has little energy when the Lord comes back for her. Don't think for a minute that she's going to get that body. She's going to get a body that will be incorruptible, a body full of energy and life. She will have Jesus' DNA. And her bones and her flesh will come back together like she was in her prime, only better. And that is a resurrection day when that body now refined joins together with that spirit that comes from above. Because to be absent from the body, Paul says, is to be present with the Lord. Your spirit will come down from heaven with him when he comes. And when he gets into the clouds, the body will come up from wherever it has been scattered around the world. It will come together in the greatest miracle that mankind has seen, the great resurrection. I like to call it the getting up morning. And it will be amazing. So Israel, I will open your graves. And we read more about this in Ezekiel 37 
and verse 25. Then they will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. Everybody say forever. The Jewish people will live there forever. And David, which is actually another name for David is a type of Christ. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. Say forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, with the Jewish people, after they are brought up out of the graves. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. Say forever. So the sanctuary of God will be there in Israel. Now right now, we know that there is a sanctuary in the heavens. Not made with hands. We know it as the throne room of God. It's the place where he dwells. Where his presence, his power, his wisdom, everything emanates from there. Churches have adopted the word. So that we call the meeting place where we gather for worship and prayer and the teaching of his word. We call it the sanctuary. Hopefully it's a, somewhat of a replica of the sanctuary that's in heaven. But you know, Jesus and the Father are moving the throne room to the earth. That's why the earth was made in the first place. That's why all the people have been made on the earth. Because the Lord wants somebody made in his image, a family, in his new home and around his new home. And that's why he has chosen Israel and he chose Jerusalem because it's the Temple Mount, the place where his throne will be placed, where his sanctuary will be. That's why he says Jerusalem is the joy of the whole earth. And he says, don't give God any peace because he's not going to give you any peace oh people of prayer until he makes Jerusalem the praise of the whole earth Donald Trump's most important thing was moving the US Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem he's the only one who had enough courage to do it but he did it. This is the oldest existing capital city in the world and in history. And he moved the US Embassy to Jerusalem to recognize it as the holy city, the city of the prophets, the city of God. The place where Jesus will put his throne. The capital city. I'll tell you this. It's not just the capital city of Israel. In that day, it's the capital city of the whole world. And more than that, it's the capital city of the whole universe. Because that's where Jesus will put his throne. All things exist because of him. All things are held together because of him. Nothing is here except by him. And he said, I have chosen Jerusalem as my dwelling place. That's why he says, O Israel, I have chosen you above all the nations of the world. And in these very verses that we have read, in chapters 36 and 37, he says, not because of you do I bring you back to your land, but for my holy name's sake and for my purpose. And so we read here at the end of chapter 37 
and verse 30, 26. I will make a covenant of peace with them. That is the Jewish people. It will be an everlasting covenant. Say everlasting. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. Say forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. I don't know how more profound and powerful there can be about the call of God on the Jewish people. He calls them my chosen people. Because he chose them. And he says from Zion, salvation will go to the ends of the earth. So the fourth prophecy that we will state and proclaim it off into the future O oh, Israel, by the word of the Lord, you shall come up out of your graves and you shall dwell in the land forever. And the Lord will put his sanctuary among you and he will be your God and you will be his people and all the world will know that he has made you holy. You cannot be holy by stopping cigarette smoking or stopping from going to the movie theater or stopping from dancing. You cannot be made holy by cutting your hair a certain way or by eating certain foods. You cannot be made holy by even the best intentions of kindness or giving to the poor. You cannot be made holy by anything that you yourself will do. Because holiness is a divine aspect of the nature and personality of God. And you only become holy when he makes you holy. When he puts his holiness upon you. When he gives you the divine Shekinah glory of God over you and covers you and wraps you in it. And then you are holy, set aside, put aside, sanctified unto the Lord. And he dwells with you and you with him. And we will prophesy it over the people of Israel in Jerusalem on our final of the four prophecies. So, at the Mediterranean, we prophesied the blessings over the land. At the Sea of Galilee, we will prophesy the coming together, the aliyah of the people, the dry bones of Israel coming together. And all the infrastructure of flesh coming upon them. And down by the Dead Sea, we will prophesy revival and a spiritual move of God for the taking away of their sins and the infilling of the Holy Spirit that they might be a people of God, not just in law, but in spirit and in truth with power and the glory of God. And lastly, we will go up to Zion. We will go up to Jerusalem. And there we will prophesy, looking across the Kidron Valley at the Mount of Olives. And we will prophesy in advance. Graves! You will open in the name of the Lord. And God's people will come forth. And they will live in this land. 
And God will be their God. And you will be his people. And he will put his sanctuary in the middle of you, among you. And make a covenant of peace forever with you. And all the nations will know that he has made you holy because he has put his sanctuary, his throne, and his presence, and his dwelling place in your midst. Those are the four covering prophecies which are crying out to be spoken over the land. Those of you coming with us to Israel, you are in for a very powerful time. Expect the supernatural manifestation of the glory of God. We will have another trip in February, and I expect that we will prophesy again. So get ready. Be in prayer. Look to the Lord for vision, revelation, dreams, and angels. This is a time of the rising of Israel. And once Israel rises, the whole world will rise. Will you stand to your feet? Let's pray together. Would you hold your hands out in front of you now and pray this prayer in a good, strong voice? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. Lord, I give you everything. I thank you for your great plan, for your blessings for Israel, for your blessings for the nations of the world. Lord, I stand with you. And I bless your chosen people and all that you would do with them. Open my eyes. And give me focus. Let me prophesy. Bring forth your word into reality. The word that Ezekiel saw 3,000 years ago. Let it come forth now. We speak it into existence in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hand on your heart now. And I'm going to bless you and those watching online. I ask you to stop what you're doing. Put your hand on your heart. Now in the name of the Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, I release a fresh blessing of the Lord upon you. I open the deep places inside of you for the river of God, for the power of heaven, for all of God's goodness to come like billows of water over you, that you might know the refreshing of the Lord in these days, regardless of your worrisome struggles. You'll put them to the side, and I speak rejuvenation and life as life will come to Israel, I speak it to you for the glory of the Lord and his power to be on you and your marriage and your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. I speak it over you now. I release to you God's favor, his joy, his righteousness, and his peace. I speak it forth in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, and God bless you. One, two, and three, they're over here. You can come and get them.